and we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, latest in the LF Energy webinar series. This one is about building the LF Energy community and building open source communities in general. We have a great speaker this morning, my old friend John O'Bacon. Technically not that old, but you know, we just let these things go. Uh, is here to talk to us about uh, community and some of the really good fundamental aspects of building community. Uh, this is an extremely important part of any open source project and it's doubly important I think for LF Energy because we have uh, eight or eight or nine projects now and uh, a lot of community building is going on. We want to make sure that we're all doing it in the right way. So um, as I said before if you have any questions you can either raise your hand or reach out to me through the chat. Uh, if you have a question for Jono during the event, you can add it. You can either add it in the chat or you can use the Q&A box, which is probably the best way to do it. Uh, all those controls should be around the bottom of your screen. And with that, I will hand it over to Jono. All right. Thanks, Jeffro. And hello, uh, morning, afternoon, evening, middle of the night, wherever you may be. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Let me share my screen. Uh, we'll get cracking on this. Okay. Okay, can you see a slide? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So what I'm going to talk about today, when I was originally talking with Shuli and, and Jeffro and the team was um, kind of, let me move this thing out of the way. We don't want that in the way. Um, was um, kind of an introduction to, to how you build communities. So this is actually, this, this session that I'm going to go through doesn't get into the nitty gritty details of specifically, for example, setting up GitHub repos and, and those kinds of pieces. This is kind of, you can think of it as the blueprint, the schematic for how to go about building a community. Now, um, if there is interest, I actually have, for example, an additional presentation, which then goes into loads of very specific technical recommendations around open source specifically, which we can do. But I think before we get to something like that, we really need to focus on on, on the core fundamentals. And, and usually when people say core fun fundamentals, it's, it's fairly uninteresting, it, it, it's fairly boring stuff. Uh, but I think this is not boring, it's just really shows you how all the other pieces fit into it. You can think of it as a table of contents of how we go about building communities. Um, so to kind of get into this, I need to provide a little bit of background. So I was born in North Yorkshire in England. Um, it's very picturesque, but it's incredibly dull, uh, especially for a, a young kid. Um, and when I was growing up um, in the 90s, especially, and uh, around the late 90s, when I was kind of a, a teenager, um, I used to hear this all the time. People don't know their neighbors like they did back in the good old days. And th th there was this kind of sentiment that was brewing that kind of the internet and movies and, and video games and things like that were killing the sense of community, that people didn't get together, people didn't hang out. And um, what I was seeing online, even in, in those earlier days back in the late 90s, was the opposite of that. I was seeing the growth of Wikipedia, where instead of having big old bulky Encyclopedia Britannicas, you'd, you know, you'd be able to go online and find information. I was seeing uh, the growth of open source, even in those early days. And of course, of course, we've seen that continue around the world. Open source is dominating the cloud and devices and grids and, and all the rest of it. Uh, we've seen the maker revolution happen where the distance between ats and bits has, has shortened. So people are no longer just building amazing technology, but they're building hardware and the collaboration between hardware and software, uh, hardware and software. And we've also seen the democratization of funding. You know, historically, you'd have to go to a, a VC and give away a big chunk of your company to get funded. Now people are running Kickstarter campaigns and Indiegogo campaigns. I've run two of them um, that have been very profitable, for example. So we're seeing this all over the place. You know, Harley Davidson, they've built over 1,700 local user groups around, around the world. Salesforce and SAP have built communities of over a million members. Star Citizen raised $250 million in crowdfunded donations. Lego Ideas actually have people who build Lego sets and then they'll, they'll sell them. I just saw one yesterday. They built a Lego set of the home from Home Alone uh, that uh, one of their community members created and now they're going to be releasing that. And Hit Record is a, is a service that was set up by this guy called Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who actually met at the Open Source Summit when he did a keynote there, and he contributed a bit of content to my book. Um, and basically, uh, basically, he's created a place where people can kind of collaborate together around um, productions, and many of these are showcased at Sundance. Now, one, one fundamental example of this, I think, would be Fitbit, right? 
if you go to the Fitbit community, you're not just um, kind of talking about their Fitbit exercise trackers. You're talking about how to swim better, how to, you know, what are the benefits of intermittent fasting? What, what types of food should you be eating depending on what your fitness goals are? It's about tapping into the insight of the, of the community to further the overall mission of the organization. So how this applies to, to each of you is that when you build an amazing community, you don't just build great technology, but you share insight, you share expertise, you share best practice. And sometimes that can actually be even more valuable than the software itself. Now, the reason why this works is because communities are really fundamentally this kind of network of minds, of talent, of expertise, right? And when we, when we glue people together, we open up an enormous amount of resourcing. So I know that I think pretty much everybody here works for a company, right? And when you work for a company, the major challenge that you always face is around resourcing, right? You have an idea for a piece of software something that's going to be in LF Energy, for example. Well, what do you need? You need developers. You need documentation writers. You need people to do testing. You need people to write copy. You need people to uh, set up partnership um, uh, uh, agreements and deals. You need people to work with governments. This all takes time and energy. And ultimately, when you start out with any project, you've got a fixed set of resources, um, and you hit the limitation on those resources usually pretty quickly. The great benefit of communities is that when we build a community, we're able to expand that resourcing. And not only that, but we bring in all of that insight as well. So what I'm going to go through in this session um, is going to be some of these core fundamentals around communities. Now, a lot of this is in my book, People Powered. It came out in November. My goal here is not to shill this book, but I just wanted to mention this, that if this is interesting to you, this is a business book. It's published by HarperCollins, and it basically goes through you know, the value proposition of communities, how you go about building a community strategy, and then how you integrate it into a business. Okay, so we'll go into more depth. And then actually, at the end of this, I'm going to give you a link where you can go and get a couple of free chapters of it. So let's start right at the beginning. Now, um, all communities, every single one of them out there can be boiled down into three models. The first one is what I call a consumer community. This is where people come together because they have a common interest. They're, they're interested in the same thing, right? They may be interested in Taylor Swift or strange, strange things. They may be interested in the Tiger King. Uh, they may be interested in a piece of software or a service. Um, and these communities are relatively straightforward. You set up a forum or a Slack channel and off you go. Um, and part of the reason why they work is because we're really tribal you know, creatures. We like to spend time with, with people who, are, who have shared interests and, and cons consumer communities work because of that. In fact, some of the largest communities in the world fall into this category, such as anime. There's anime communities with hundreds of millions of members. Um, the second type is champion communities. These are people who come together because, uh, and they want to go the extra mile. They want to create content. They want to provide support. Um, they want to run events. And this is where I'd say the majority of organizations who I work with fall into, okay? They create these champion communities. Now, um, this is typically where user communities around software tend to, tend, to, to, tend to focus. Now, I think this will apply a little bit, uh, you know, this is kind of less focused on, um, on the work that you folks are doing because you're, you're kind of building technology in, in more of a niche industry. Um, but this is where you start tapping into the notion of community members creating content that benefits other people. You're not just providing a place for people to hang out. But where I think it applies to us is really around collaborator communities. And I tend to subdivide these into two different types. Collaborator communities are people who build things and they collaborate on the same things. Now, inner collaborator communities are open source, right? It's the projects that each of you are working on. It's where when you build your community, which may comprise of people in different companies and organizations, um, you have to get people on the same team and to feel like they're collaborating using this, uh, on, the, on the same ground. Because if you have one set of rules for one group of people, a different set of rules for a different group of people, it's going to create some animosity. And the reason for that is if you're all working on the same thing, then you all want to be treated like equals. Okay, It doesn't mean you all do the same level of work, right? but it means that the, the, the standards of practice should be the same. The way in which you submit code, the way in which it's reviewed, the way in which you track issues, all of those different pieces. Okay. So, so that's an inner collaborator community. And the Linux Foundation, in large part, is there to facilitate setting up, you know, kind of a, a fair footing for these kinds of open source communities. Now, outer collaborator communities are a little different. This is where you build technology that sits on top of a platform or a system. So that could be building plugins for WordPress. It could be building apps for the Google App Store or the Apple App Store, for example. This is a little bit different because developers, for example, who build those kinds of apps, they don't particularly care about being involved in every decision um, or it being an equal footing when it comes to 
you know, how that whole community is structured and is operating because they know all they want is a great SDK and they want to get visibility on the content, right? And their apps. Whereas if you're in the inner community, you want to make sure that there are open meetings, there is governance, there are, you know, meeting notes and things like that because you're part of the same team. Now, so the first thing I'd think about is when you're thinking about communities, whether it applies to kind of uh, LF Energy or whether it's applying elsewhere, because everything I'm talking about today can apply to anything from setting up a knitting circle to setting up a global technology group to how you build communities inside of your businesses to how you build communities around your hobbies or your interests everything's going to apply so the first one we want to think about is what kind of community template do we want to use because the way in which we build the community is going to is going to vary a little bit now one of the big mistakes that the vast majority of people who i see building communities make is that they over index on outreach. And what I mean by that is they do tons of social media, blogging, YouTube videos. They're, they're, they're just constantly, it's about generating content and getting it out and making noise. And the problem with that approach is that is the first part of how you bring people in. But for people to really participate and actually and, and, and deliver great results in the community, you need to nurture them and build retention and, and build engagement. And the way in which we do this is with a journey. The best experiences in life are journeys. If you go to Disney, um, you know, from how you park your car to how you buy your ticket to how you're guided around the park and which rides you go on to, which restaurants are open at which times to when the parades happen, everything's carefully curated. They want to maximize the number of guests and maximize the quality of the guest experience. If you go to a restaurant, uh, from how you book your table, if you go to a, a fancy restaurant, to how you valet your car, to how you get the menu and they bring you water and how often they come and ask you if you need anything. It's a carefully crafted experience. Uh, another example of this is video games. Um, I bought Luigi's Mansion 3 for our seven-year-old boy, Jack. I mean, if I'm being honest, I bought it for me and he can just watch me play it. Um, but the reason why I bought it is because it's a great game. And when you start playing it, the first couple of levels teach you the controls. They give you tasks that are really easy to do, but not too easy. So it builds that journey. Everything is about building a journey, all right? So when we think about communities, we have to think about the same thing. How do people come in? How do you nurture them? And how do you build a sense of belonging? Now, the belonging piece is really important. It might sound like some foo-foo fluffy nonsense, but at the end of the day, when you throw away all of the computers and the screens and the cell phones, right, we are animals. And as animals, we have a psychological pattern and we need to understand that psychological pattern and adapt our communities to it. Otherwise, we're not going to create a community that's going to resonate with people. It's just going to make sense on paper. So I want to dip into this psychology a little bit. And again, everything I'm talking about here doesn't just apply to LF Energy. It's going to apply to any community you want to, you want to build, especially inside of your businesses as well. So this is essentially what happens when people come into a community. The first thing they need is they need access. They need to be able to get in and do something. They need access to the tools, to the knowledge. And I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about how you do that a little bit later on. Then they start contributing. They start writing code. They start uh, using the software and providing feedback and input. They start filing bugs. Um, they start contributing. And when they, when they start doing that and those contribut contributions are recognized, it builds a sense of self-respect that they are adding value. Because we as human beings, we typically want to add value when we're going through communities. And then at that point, um, they start building a sense of dignity. Now, dignity is really important. This is where they don't just feel like they're adding value, but they feel like this is important. The work that they're doing is meaningful. And there's been a lot of research that we feel like we have to do work that's meaningful. I'm sure all of you, when you wake, woke up this morning and went to work, you didn't just think, I can't wait to earn my paycheck. No, you woke up and you thought, I'm going to be able to make the world better in some meaningful way. And LF Energy is a great example of that, right? This is not just some, you know, bullshit, um, you know, group that's hanging out doing work with each other. This is going to change the notion of how we do things with energy on the planet. And that's amazing. So when you start building that dignity, it then gives you the confidence to have an impact. At the beginning of any, like when you join a new business, right? You don't feel like you can go and have big ideas because you're too new. But once you've been there for a while and you've kind of got to know people and people trust you, you can then start proposing the big new ideas. And that's when you start having an impact. When you can have that impact, that's what builds belonging. Now, belonging is that sense of, you know, I'm kind of part of something. It's where if I go away for two or three weeks on vacation, um, I'm going to be missed. And I don't mean that from a narcissistic perspective. I mean that from a, you know, um, you know, I'm not just here as an observer. I'm here as a producer. Um, and this is when you build that sense of belonging, you build retention in a community that will last years. 
you know. Uh, Jeffro mentioned that we've known each other for, for years. And the reason why we've known each other for many years is we met through open source. And there's a reason why we're still in open source is because we feel a sense of belonging in this community. Is it not just within the Linux Foundation, the LF Energy and elsewhere, but really the broader community is it feels like a place where we belong and where we can have an impact. So when we think about building new communities, we've got to focus on opening up access, following through that, and then generating that sense of belonging, right? And it usually takes about two months to kind of start building the early stages of belonging because it takes about two months to build a habit. So if you want to lose weight, you want to stop boozing as much in pandemic lockdown, um, if you want to, you know, start blogging more, then it, at the beginning of that process, it's really hard and you've got to kind of stay on the wagon. But then gradually it becomes easier and you really build kind of, uh, you build a habit. And when you build a habit, you kind of rewire your brain a little bit and it doesn't feel as hard to do. And that's what we want to do is build that sense of belonging. Now, the challenge with this is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you right now a, a, a really, really cutting edge piece of technology. Um, I had my team spend hundreds of millions of dollars to build a special camera that's going to take that able to take a picture of the inside of the human brain and it looks like this it's just a complete garbage dump of distractions it's twitter it's whatever the hell is going on in politics right now it's the new gadgets that are coming out it's the playstation 5 it's what your family needs it's what your friends need it's you know what new gin is coming out we're living in a world filled with distractions. So if you're going to build a community, we've got to be able to pierce through the noise. And, the, and this all begs the question, what makes people want to do something new? Well, it's fairly simple. It's got to give them value. We are mercenary creatures, right? When you want to learn something, for example, you go to YouTube, um, you just want the video. You just want the content. You don't want to listen through the intro and them telling you how to subscribe a million times. You just want the information. When you buy a book, you don't really want to read through it typically. You just want the facts. And that's what people want in, in, in the world. Now, value kind of breaks down into a couple of areas. One is going to be the value for the company. So you are members of this project and um, you know, you're going to want to get something out of it. Um, but then there's the community. What does the community get out of it? What does the LF Energy community get out of, uh, of participating? I would always recommend with any community, you start with what do the members want first? They want to solve problems. They want to perform, develop skills. They want to increase their network. They want to perform career development. They want to have fun. These are the kind of things that most individual community members care about. So we need to be able to deliver that value to bring them in and to get them excited. But on the company side, the company cares about usually very, very different things. User growth, building an ecosystem, developing features, um, you know, in, in providing support and guidance, increasing the level of brand recognition. So if you start with focusing on the company stuff, and when I work with clients, nine times out of 10, when I start an engagement, they'll rattle off kind of what they want to, what they want to achieve, brand recognition, feature development, building growth. And I'll turn the tables and say, okay, well, what do we think your audience wants? Because if we start there, we'll generate value. Now, the tricky thing with value is that it usually exists at the top of the strategic process, right? So we sit down and we, we sit around boardroom tables and virtual boardroom tables on Zoom. And we say, what do we want to get out of this? Um, and then what we do is we develop the tactics and the strategy. And eventually all these higher level pieces will boil down into the nitty gritty day-to-day -day stuff, the setting up of forums, the setting up of mailing lists, the Slack discussions, the the meeting notes, the working groups, all of the, all the detailed stuff that I'm sure you spend most of your time talking about within this project. The problem is, is that sometimes we get so focused on the tactics that we forget the value that we're wanting to deliver. So I'm going to talk a little bit later on about how I would recommend you approach that value um, because I think it's going to be really important. Um, but this is it's important that we, <clears throat> we bake the value into the tactics. And, and to do that, we first of all need to map out that journey. And then we break that journey down into our strategy. So let's start out with the journey. Now, over the course of the last 20 odd years that I've been working um, professionally building communities. Um, so Jeffro, we are getting old, by the way. Um, it, it's official. I just realized that. No, no, we're not. But a fine wine, a fine wine that's been stored incorrectly. Um, so 
I've developed this, um, what I call the community participation framework. And this is basically a model for how to think about going about building that community journey. So let's break it down. Uh, right at the beginning, <clears throat> we first of all need to target, define our audience, right? And this is usually going to be defined by what do we want them to do? Do we want them to provide support, create content? Do we want them to do engineering work? Uh, do we want them to run events? Do we want them to be translators? And you want to prioritize this. So you may, for example, say within these open source projects, we need engineering. That's the number one thing. Well, what engineers care about and the value that is useful to them is going to vary significantly from the kind of people who like going out to coordinate uh, meetups and speak at events. So we first of all need to prioritize what are the most important elements. And then secondly, we need to determine what are the attributes of those people, right? Are they, are they an executive? Are they an engineer? Are they a marketer? So to give you an example, if you say we want to build a community of engineers, right? So they're going to be doing engineering work and they are by definition engineers. They're going to be very comfortable hanging out in GitHub. They're going to be very comfortable in Slack channels and forums and, uh, and discussing topics and issues and things like that. Online collaboration is, you can't avoid it if you're a software engineer. It's just what, what you do. But if you're an executive, let's say you're talking to people, you want to build a community around energy companies and, and, and kind of the stakeholders, most executives don't go and hang out in forums. They, they may use Slack a little bit, but they're primarily going to be e creatures of email habit. They're going to be all about Zoom conversations, one-on-one -on -one discussions, rich interaction. Okay, So we, we, we can't force one type of person into a different type of bucket. So then I'd want to design those two communities very differently. For example, I'm working with a company right now who are in the storage space, and we're building an engineering community. And it's all on a forum and, and, and it's technical in nature and all the rest of it. It's all about solving engineering problems uh, uh, and making their lives as easy as possible. But for the executives, we're building a much closer knit invitation only. It's less than 100 people. Um, it's, you know, kind of partners and executives and affiliates. Um, and that's all about very specific curated content and discussions. It's super high value um, in a different way. So we need to, first of all, think about our audience. Then what we do is we... Um, we need to onboard them. Now, this again is something that I think is a mistake that a lot of community uh, leaders make is that they go out, they raise awareness, they, 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 they get people involved in community projects. Someone shows up, they're fresh meat <laughs> to come and participate, whether it's being uh, an engineer in a project or something else, and then they cannot figure out how to get started, right? Uh, and this problem becomes exponentially worse the more complicated projects become. So if you've got a very simple open source project uh, and it's easy to build, then you can download it, you can build it, and off you go. But if you've got a really complicated open source project, I'm guessing many of the projects you're working on are more complicated and it requires specialist kind of testing and documentation and architectural considerations, maybe a certification elements in how that, that code should be, should be put together and standards you know, um, enforcement then it get, becomes incredibly complicated. So when someone's new, they need to be able to navigate that complexity. And that's the reason why an onboarding experience is really important. We wanna get them to the start. That is a piece of value that they can consume as quickly and as easily as possible, okay? So this is all about getting them to generate some value and to consume some value as easily as possible. And I tend to break it into six areas. So let's say we're talking about uh, an engineer, right? And they're joining one of your open source projects. Well, the first step is why on earth should they participate? Remember that the human brain is packed with distractions. You've got to get over why this is worth their time. What is the value they're going to get out of the project? What is the impact that they can make? Then the engineer is going to need to set up the tools. They're going to need to uh, make sure that they've got all the necessary build tools, download the code, build the code. Um, and that in itself, I've seen some open source projects where it takes, you know, two hours for them to build the damn thing. And that's unacceptable. If it takes longer than 10 minutes, it's called the shrink wrap gap. It was a term that Microsoft popularized back in the 80s, where from taking the shrink wrap off a piece of software to doing something simple but useful with the software, if it takes longer than 10 minutes, you've failed. We need to take the same approach to our open source projects. So we need to be able to get them up and running within 10 minutes, ideally, in terms of setting up the tools. And then they need to be able to build the skills. This is going to be getting started guides, like great documentation, just doing something, right? Being, being able to develop the skills as quickly, as easy as possible. And then the tangible engagement piece, this is about finding something to do. So for example, in a lot of open source projects, you've got good first bug, 
or good first issue where it's a something simple that people can go and find. They can, you know, it could be a spelling mistake in the code. It could be a, a small UX issue. Um, it could be something else um, that needs to be changed. It's very easy for existing developers to just go and fix that. And they can do that very quickly. Um, but you want to leave some of those, frankly, hanging so you can welcome your new contributors so they can start doing something like that as, as easily as possible. And then the fifth one is solving problems. How do they, how do they solve the, the inevitable challenges that they're going to have? They're going to have questions. Where do they go and ask those questions? This is why I'd always recommend you set up a discourse forum or a Slack channel or something along those lines. And then the sixth one, um, and the reason why the first one and the sixth one have got an extra circle around it is because this applies to pretty much every on-ramp, irrespective of what your audience is, whether it's engineering, executives, or something else. When they've made that first contribution, when they've generated that first piece of value, you want to validate it. I don't care whether you are a road sweeper or whether you run Microsoft. Everybody needs validation. Everyone needs to know they're on the right track. So you need to recognize and say, we really appreciate the fact that you did this. It's awesome. Thank you for joining the community. That's fantastic. So if we're intentional about these six steps, we will simplify the onboarding experience. So when we go out and do the outreach, we know that we're going to get people to convert into contributors uh, much more efficiently. All right. So that's the first piece. Now, the second half of this is, is the journey. So we, we talked earlier about Disney, restaurants, video games, is about how you nurture that journey. Well, this piece is what that's all about. When someone joins a new community and they've generated that first piece of value or they consume that first piece of value, they become casual members. They don't really know anyone. They feel a bit weird. They've probably got a lot of imposter syndrome. They don't want to put a foot wrong, especially in professional communities like LF Energy. You know, you don't want to, frankly, appear like an idiot and all these business books say, you know, there's no silly questions and failure is something you should embrace. That's a nice thing for people to think about, but people rarely actually put that in action. So when people are brand new to a community, even if they're like seasoned enterprise software engineers, we need to nurture them. Um, when they've been around for a little while, and I'll talk about how we do that later on, they then become regulars. This is when you've kind of hit that two month period and we're starting to build that sense of belonging. Um, this is where you want to kind of get people connected to each other and, and just get out of their way and enable them to deliver great work. And then a very small number of people in your community will become what I call core members. These are your super fans, right? These are the people who don't just care about their experience. They care about the overall success of the community itself. And these are the people you know by name. You don't have to use a system to detect these people. They're just the people you, you will just share in meetings. Wow, that person's amazing, right? We all look up to those folks, okay? Um, now, the way we move people from casual to regulars to core is with incentives, okay? Now, incentives are, again, a very powerful element of human psychology. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk about growth and engagement a little bit later on. But I want to touch on this incentives piece because I think it's really important. Because if you just kind of kick open the doors to your community, you've got your onboarding, it's very, very difficult to then... Um, build that consistent growth if you don't intentionally map out how you guide people from casual to regular to core. And this is why incentives are really important. So as a little bit of background, um, incentives are basically where you say, it, it, you know, you, you reward a behavior um, that you want to see, right? So you understand what is the behavior that we want to encourage in our community, in our businesses and elsewhere. And then what do we do to incentivize and recognize and reward that behavior? So incentives are everywhere, right? We collect our airline miles. We go to the coffee shop and you get your 10 stamps on your coffee card and the 10th stamp gets you a free coffee or your sandwich card. Um, you know, you, you hit 1,600 miles on Fitbit and you get the Great Barrier Reef uh, badge. You have video game trophies. You've got Karma in Reddit and other platforms. The reason why incentives work is that psychologically, the brain is broken into two pieces. It's called system one thinking and system two thinking. System one thinking is essentially our, it's innate monkey brain, right? It's, it's if I snuck up behind you and went boo, the fact that you jump is your system one part of your brain reacting to that situation. Uh, you can't really control it. It's just baked in. It's the bias of how, how, how our psychology works. The second part, system two thinking, is our conscious thought. And what we, what, what most of us don't realize is that our system one part influences a massive amount of our behavior. There's a whole 
science around this called behavioral economics that's that's really interesting that i'd recognize i'd recommend you start reading into in fact go and get the book it's called predictably irrational by a guy called dan Ariely. is a great place to start now the reason why incentives work is because psychologically we are hunter gatherers right we uh, we want to procure resources to protect ourselves and protect our families it's baked into us as human beings that's the reason why human beings have survived for so many years so incentives are all about tapping into that instinct is that if you do this thing you will get this thing and that's the reason why they work so psychologically they're very very powerful because they are wired directly into the bias of how of how the human our human psychology works there's basically two ways in which you can think about incentives the first one is called stated this is where you say if you do this thing you will get this other thing okay so uh, let's start with it with, with stated and kind of walk through how they work um a stated incentive could be, for example, a competition. GitHub run the GitHub game off every year. A friend of mine called Lee Riley runs it. And they basically say, if you are the winner, you get this prize. Similarly, uh, 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 there's a, uh, uh, a startup called Hacker One. They're kind of less of a startup now. They've become a, kind of a big company. Um, and they provide a platform where people can provide security vulnerabilities for people's products. Now, they have a leaderboard and they recognize people in their community, they, their contributions are essentially scored and they go up the, up the leaderboard. So what happens here is that uh, as you get more points in Hacker One, then you get recognized in different ways and, open, and new opportunities open up. If you do this thing, you get this thing. Another example of this is gonna be badges, right? This is Stack, o Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange. In the middle part of the screenshot, you can see that the favorite question badge on the left you get this if you have your question favorited by 25 users, and that's been awarded 51,000 times. So if you do this thing, you get this thing. So that's interesting, right? And this is where incentives usually kick in, right? If you get your 10th coffee card stamp, you get the free coffee. If you walk a certain amount of miles on Fitbit, you get the badge. It's stipulated. Now, this is especially powerful for people in the casual phase of the journey. Right. There's a reason why when you play a new video game, there's tons of badges and, and trophies in there because it gives it taps into that sense of collecting and it's that game theory element. But usually at some point, people are going to kind of get a little bit bored with this. They feel like they've collected enough. They've got enough badges. They don't really care about it. It's not very exciting anymore. And this is where the submarine incentive is kicking. So a submarine incentive is where you basically say, I'm going to detect the behavior I want to see with a computer. And then I'm going to recognize and reward it with a human being. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, a technique that I use with a lot of my clients when I'm helping them to build communities is where we use, often use a piece of software called Discourse, which is a great forum for building communities. And inside of Discourse, it's got something called trust levels. And basically, as you just participate in the, in the community as a, as a member, um, depending on the combination of reading, of posting, of liking, of ha having your stuff liked, whether you filled in your profile, you go up these trust levels automatically. And you can kind of set the criteria for this. So when people hit trust level two, which means that you've been around for a little while, you've done a, a pretty decent amount. We've, you're definitely, you've definitely been there for probably a month or two. We're starting to see that sense of retention. Then what I like to do is rebrand the trust level to name it as, uh, as a member so I tend to rebrand it as silver in many cases. And then we recognize them just by simply posting uh, an, uh, you know, a post on the community and saying, thank you so much to these members for doing this amazing work. Okay, so the one, the screenshot on the right, for example, is the Clear Linux forum for when I was doing some work with Intel. And the first couple of Clear Linux uh, silver members were George Castro and this guy called Doctor Who. We recognize that it got a ton of likes, a, a, a ton of support. Everybody would respond and say, congratulations, that's awesome. And what this does is it, first of all, recognizes those people. It makes them feel good. But it also sends a message in the community that we're paying attention, that we're watching and recognizing great work when it happens. Remember, everybody needs that sense of validation. And that's the reason why this is powerful. We do the same thing on the left. This is with the Open Zeppelin community. Okay, so this is a very, very powerful way of, of, of doing that. And the other thing to highlight here is it doesn't cost anything beyond a bit of staff time. It's not like we have to send them swag and material and all that kind of stuff. Just a simple post of recognition. Sending them a thank you email can also work. It's that the elders in the community are recognizing the people who are newer there. Another example here will be opensource.com. 
Uh, this is a, 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 it's a f fabulous website with tons of news and articles and tutorials about open source. About 60% of their content is generated by community members. And when people hit certain levels of the amount of content they've submitted, they get swag. They get this open source backpack, for example. I carried mine around for years. Um, Mattermost, when you f submit your first uh, pull request that gets accepted into the project, they send you a branded mug, which again, is pretty cool. Um, another example here will be opensource.com again. And this is where the, kind of the top flight people, the people who are the most active in the community for the, uh, for the overall year, Red Hat, who are the company that facilitates opensource.com, would fly people out to Raleigh um, to join the All Things Open conference, which is a fabulous conference run by this guy called uh, Todd Lewis. Um, and then there'd be a set of meetings at the Red Hat Tower, and then they get to meet the Red Hat team. And here you can see them all pointing towards Jim Whitehurst, who was the CEO of Red Hat and is now the president of IBM. So it's a really, really like enjoyable, fun trip. And the vast majority of people always say, that's the highlight of my year. So that gives you a bit of a sense. So when we look at this journey, just to recap at this point, before I kind of pull this into the closing line, um, you identify your audience, uh, you onboard them so they can generate some value. You guide them through this journey from casual to regular to core by using incentives to keep pushing them forward. Okay, that's kind of how we think about building the journey. That's how we make the Disney World. That's how we make the restaurant. That's how we make the Luigi's Mansion 3 equivalent in our community. But you're all probably asking the question, well, how, do you, how on earth do you get people in? Well, that's what growth is. So growth is, and I'm just going to very briefly skim over this, that the way we get people into our community is with content, social media, email, webinars, and events. This is all the outreach stuff that I mentioned earlier on. But as you can see, if you only focus on the outreach, like so many community members, so many community managers do, and you don't have this model in place, then they're just stepping into a void. So that's why we have to be structured. So focus on the growth to pull people in that to use a marketing term, fills your funnel, and it starts getting them through the process. And then once they're going through this, we need to engage them. Now, we've already talked about the incentives and the first contribution, but thematically, what you want to do is in the casual phase, this is all about mentoring. Provide them with guidance and support. Think about when you've joined new companies or when people have joined your companies. What does your HR team do? Well, they'll often assign you a mentor. And they'll guide you through and they'll go through onboarding training and they'll introduce you to your systems. They don't just let you join and then say, go and figure it out yourself in most, in most companies. In some companies they do, but as companies get bigger and they hire more people, they have to scale out that piece. It's the same thing here. So we provide mentoring and guidance and support. And this is where you can actually ask your existing members of your community, such as your regulars and your core members to provide that mentoring. This is how you build scale. The second phase is in, in the regulars, this is about collaboration. This is where you um, connect people together and say, let's go and do interesting new things, right? So for example, if you've got a project within LF Energy, it could be engaging your regular developers, your regular members and saying, well, why don't we do meetups? Why don't we ask everybody to, to run a meetup locally? Why don't we put work together on some, some, um, some materials? Maybe we can put together a 12 page PDF with, you know, the most pressing kind of innovations going on in energy and open source. And we can make that as kind of a, a download that people can get. Why do we put together um, a two minute ad video that, that we can put out there about these projects? This is where you, you encourage people to have that impact. And then thirdly, the, and finally, for core people, this is about saying to these people who are, who are, who've been around for a long time, who are passionate about the project, how can we make this better? You bring them onto your team and tap into their insight. When I was working building out the Ubuntu community at Canonical, I would have weekly calls with about seven or eight people who were the core members of our community. And we just, I just want to learn from them. Like, what can we do to improve? And I'd include them in those meetings. In fact, I'd fly them out to my team sprints um, to come and spend time with us. You know, many of these people signed an NDA so we could have those conversations confidentially. So that's kind of the model. And I want to kind of kind of tail off this and wrap this, uh, this, this webinar, and then we can get into some, um, into some Q and A with how do you build the roadmap around this? So, okay, that sounds good, Jono, but that's a lot of detail. How do we actually get this into, into action? Well, I will defer you all to the greatest rock band that's ever graced the earth. And that is, of course, I know you all agree with me. It's Iron Maiden. Um, I've been a fan of Iron Maiden since I was 11. I went to see them when I was 11 with my dad and my bowl haircut in 1992. Um, 
and they're they're a phenomenal band and they pull off these massive tours they have a a, a jumbo jet that they hire and they they brand the singer of the band this guy in the middle uh next to the guy with the long hair on the left bruce dickinson he flies the plane um they fly around they they have to ha have these huge stage sets and they've got to figure out visas and immigration documents for their crew um and you know it's an enormous amount of detail <clears throat> and logistics and their uh, manager rod smallwood was asked one time how on earth do you pull off these incredibly complicated elaborate tours in parts of the world with different resources and ground crews and power and all these different pieces and he said it's pretty simple you make a plan and you stick to it and this is the big mistake that a lot of companies make a lot of organize, organizations make is they love making the plans because making the plans is fun and creative and engaging but they don't stick to the plan and my view is very simple professionals don't wing it right what we need to do is we need to put together a plan and we need to execute in that plan if we don't stick to it then we don't get a consistent uh, work delivered so what i would recommend you do with your communities is what i call the big rocks workflow and this is what i put into this book people powered is that the first thing you do is you create a straw man of what we want to do in the next year and this is a high level set of goals this is um okay for our particular lf energy project we want to do these three things right these are the audiences we're going to target this is the infrastructure we need to set up these are the uh these are the incentives and rewards we're going to deliver and you create that five to seven page document fairly high level kind of like objective key results um that that says these are the things we're going to work on then you get a round of feedback from the people most connected to that project um, that's going to build skin in the game i don't think you can build great communities unless people feel like they can get their fingerprints onto the plan so if you build it just one or two of you sit there in a vacuum and build it you won't get the buy-in so we need that first round of feedback and then what you do is you start saying what does success look like for us what are the kpis the key performance indicators for doing this well so you add those into the plan and then you get an additional round of feedback maybe from the public members of the project from other companies that are involved maybe from members of the linux foundation to kind of come in and provide additional feedback and then you lock it in and when you lock it in you basically say this is our course of action that we're going to focus on for the next year again this model works for open source projects it works for internal com company communities all kinds of different communities so at this point you've got a plan but then what we need to do is we need to break it down into the tactics and what i would recommend you do is that you operate on a cadence and what i mean by that is basically every uh you, you take your one-year plan and then you operate in six month cycles this is something i learned um when i was at canonical and i use this with so many of my clients is that what you do is you first of all plan out the cycle so that's the gray bit at the beginning um and this is usually at the end of the previous cycle or just before you start your first cycle and you say what do we want to do in, in the next six months so you take whatever the most pressing elements are of your big rocks right and you say let's do these specific things and you break it down into all the individual tactics what are the individual tasks that we need to do and each task should be no longer than a half day's uh, worth of work otherwise you know if one of your tasks has run a conference then that's a big meaty task that you need to break down into smaller pieces and then you have weekly syncs with the people who are involved in that task to kind of keep them on the right track and keep things moving forward and then halfway through that cycle three months in you do a quarterly review you basically say are we making progress on our goals you don't change your strategy significantly okay because the big mistake with with strategic program management is people change their plans constantly so then they they never get beyond the first couple of steps because they keep rebooting so halfway through that cycle you say how are we doing how can we improve our performance how can we are our weekly syncs working do we need additional calls do we need to identify different resources do we need to bring new people in um you basically modify your existing plan based upon that that conversation then you complete the cycle and at that point you review that cycle and you say how did we do do we deliver the work that we were seeking to accomplish to give you an example um one time i did one of these cycles and i had a new member of my team join called david planella who was now running community at gitlab and when he did his first six month cycle he got about 70 percent through the, his assigned work and when we had the meeting about that he was understandably quite nervous about that i think he was worried he was going to get fired and to me that was really valuable information because what that taught me was we were our estimation of the work for that cycle was too great i knew how hard david was working 
um, but we weren't estimating accurately enough. So we decided to explore how to estimate time and work more efficiently. And then on the next cycle, he got through about, about 90% of that work. So that was an improvement. And then we made some further refinements and then he was delivering exactly pretty much the, the level of work that he was estimating. So that's the reason why we keep going through these cycles is every six months you get to have the planning cycle meeting. Yeah, the cycle planning meeting rather, the weekly six, the quarterly review, you have the cycle review. Each time you do that, you learn new things. You learn how to read the data in different ways and that's how we build expertise. It took me years to realize this because as a consultant, I have influence, but I have no power, right? So I can't tell people what to do with my clients. But my goal is to get my experience and my knowledge baked into their business. And then they don't need me anymore. You don't want to be paying an expensive consultant forever. But the only way to do this is to have that repeated cycle. This is how we improve. This is how we get better. So just to wrap up, um, as I mentioned, a, a whole load of this is in my book, People Powered. I'm really proud of this. It's a business book. It came out in November. It just won a business book award. It's got um, uh, five-star reviews on Amazon and Goodreads, um, and it's a bestseller. So if, if you're interested in this, go and check it out. But also, I'm going to give you a link. If you go to johnobacon.com uh, forward slash pack, um, you can go and get a couple of chapters of the first couple of chapters of the book. It's uh, in PDF, and I'm also going to send you the audiobook chapters. So if you want to listen to my velvety English baritone reading it to you, then you can go and if that's what you get your kicks with, then you can go and do that. And I'm also going to send you a bunch of templates that are used that, that, that kind of can be used for the big rocks and the other pieces that I walk through this. And then I also just, I believe in sending people tons of value. So there's going to be video, there's going to be, you know, uh, just little bits of guidance and best practice that I'll send you as well. And that's it. Thank you everybody for listening. Great. Thank you, Jono. We do have one quick question from Nico yep. in the Q&A box. He says, is there a reason why the line is going downward toward the core? in the uh in the uh i call it the camel diagram let's go back to it so uh hang on because i think this is a great question you're talking about this diagram here yeah I believe is so. there a reason why that line is trending downwards is the seg is the reason why the segments are sized differently probably uh, yes this is very intentional um the reason for this is that you'll have a great majority of of um casual members people will come in They'll be curious. They'll be interested. You'll have a smaller proportion of people who will be regulars, and then you'll have a tiny proportion of people who are core. Now, the numbers uh, generally, and this is a broad number, don't hold me to this, is that for every 100 people who come into your community, generally about one of them will be a core member. About 10 of them will be regulars, and the rest will be casual. That's how it tends to work with most communities. Now, those numbers, those proportions will vary, of course. In some communities, 30 in every 100 will be regulars. Um, but you, the reason for this is, and this maps, for example, to traditional marketing, right? If you are going to build a funnel, the number of cold, the cold traffic out there, the people who don't really know you, and you're warming them up, it's massive. And then you start warming up, you get them to join your newsletter, your list, whatever, they become your warm audience, which are the equivalent of your regulars. And then your customers, the people who buy from you, will be a tiny proportion of that, which are your core members. So, so this is the result of just standard nurturing of human beings. That's the reason why it's, it's, it's broken out that way. Very cool. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, any other questions? Uh, there was another question from uh, Robbie who says, can you comment on thanking new contributors? I always feel that thanking others on behalf of the community is a very presumptuous act. I'm thinking of entirely volunteer communities. Yeah, so I think thanking people is really important. So there's basically two types of rewards that are out there. Um, you can have intrinsic rewards and extrinsic <laughs> rewards. So an intrinsic reward is going to be it's going to be the example, the example I gave of uh, recognizing people publicly in the community. It's going to be sending them a thank you email. I think it's really important to do. Um, and it can be as simple as a one-line email to somebody. Uh, the, the key thing is that you need to be able to obviously detect when something happens. And in the early stages of the community, you don't need complicated system setups to do that. You can just watch what's going on, right? So for example, I just spun up a new community with a friend of mine called Giorgio called Guitar Hacks, which is a place where people can learn how to play the guitar. And he's got the guitarist uh, from Megadeth, Kiko, recording guitar tutorial content. And the people in the community are, 
at, at customers and users. And we're thanking people left, right, and center because we want to make that sense of, make it feel welcome. But then you can also send people swag and things like that as well. So I think it is, I think the role of thanking is, is absolutely critical. Now, what you don't want to do is overdo it. If every person is getting thanked for everything that they do, it, then it takes away the value of the thank you. So you, you want to, you want to kind of have a limited reserve of thank yous to a degree. Um, um, certainly public thank yous, but in terms of private ones where you just email someone privately, then you can do that as much as you want. Sure. Neil comments that he says he thinks the question is about recognition by staff compared to recognition by fellow community members. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, at the beginning of a community, typically this is going to be, um, this is going to be, largely staff are going to be doing this, right? Because usually you've got a small number of people who are facilitating the community. But one of the things that's interesting about any group of human beings, whether it's a company, whether it's a community, is we tend to mimic our leaders. Um, this is actually a psychological pattern. So if you build a culture of people thanking each other and people recognizing and, and appreciating each other's work, uh, so your staff will initially do that, then your community members will start doing that too. Totally agreed. Yeah, but the, I think the maturity of the project makes a huge difference in that. Mm. So another question from uh, Jonas. In LF Energy, we have very specialized projects that require engineers with particular skills that are hard to find. How can we best reach these engineers? I think this is one of the core reasons why we wanted to hold this event. Yeah, exactly. So th that, I think, is going to get into the, the growth piece, right? So... Um, I think one of the key elements here is going to be is sitting down. One of the reasons why I recommended that you go through and figure out your target audience at the beginning, mm -hmm. that persona is you can then get a sense of, for example, what kind of content do they read? What websites do they go to? Uh, what YouTube videos do they watch? Uh, which conference does, conferences do they go to? Which open source projects are they interested in? So I'd recommend you sit down and, and figure out who those people are and that's going to give you the answers for how you go and find those people so let me give you an example um i was working with a company i can't tell you their name because i was under nda um that was basically building a javascript framework um and they wanted to build growth so what we did is at the beginning of the pro uh, of the project we we went through that persona definition that audience definition and we identified for example that um, the, the main conference that they tended to go to was Fluent um, with this specific <clears throat> type of JavaScript developer. Uh, they read Hacker News. Uh, they read Stack Overflow, especially. So what we did is we started generating a load of material and content that would go up on the blog that was kind of training and tutorial uh, content around their framework that would promote, we'd push it onto Hacker News, that would bring inbound traffic to the blog, and then people would click on a link to go and join the community. Um, we also had a pretty reasonable uh, presence at Fluent. Um, there was like a booth, there was a lot of session content, a lot of kind of just treading the boards and networking. Um, and then also the other thing that we did was paid advertising um, hmm. um, on Facebook. Now, you might think that this is a little weird because would people really pay attention to Facebook ads. It's amazing how powerful Facebook ads are. Um, everyone's got their own view on Facebook, especially right now because of Facebook's track record with privacy. Um, so some people don't feel comfortable doing this, but it's actually a really effective means of, of getting people through the door in a very targeted way. Like in Facebook, you can say, if people fall into these specific demographics, then you bring them in through some means. And what we actually did there was a webinar. We ran a webinar. Uh, had a very specific targeting towards those JavaScript folks. And it was primarily, we were targeting a cold audience of people who'd liked a bunch of different JavaScript pages on, on Facebook and kind of fell into the, the broad kind of category that we were looking for within, certain within a certain industry. And then we would, they'd come to that webinar, which was kind of a really detailed technical how-to around how to use this framework. Um, and then they'd be able to sign up and kind of get updates via email and things like that. And that's how they came into the community. But you, all of that has to begin with that definition of your audience. You need to know where they are, what they're interested in, what they like, and then you can start doing your research. Mm. Very interesting. I think it's also, there are a lot of the, these communities end up being, being uh, staffed by people who really do 
know who these stakeholders are and maybe just right. need help in articulating who those people are and reaching out to them. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Jeff. Like, I think so much of this is just, it, it sounds cheesy, but yeah. networking, like just, um, you know, speaking personally, for example, the vast majority of clients who I end up working with, the connection has come through someone who I've met at a conference or who I had a, you know, a Zoom call with through an introduction. It's just kind of getting to know people and not being mercenary and getting something out of them. I can't stand people who will like, hey, Jono, I'd like to talk to you for half an hour. And then I, within five minutes, I know this is going to be a sales pitch. It's like, <laughs> okay, well, you're on this shit list at that point. So to me, it's just kind of getting to know people. So, yep. I totally agree. All right. Well, if there's no more other questions, I know that Shirley was going to say another, say a word here at the end and um, then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Everyone. So, can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, hey, this was actually this was amazing. So I really want to thank you, and I wish I had better internet so I could look you eye to eye and say to you, um, "This is great." Um, I I want every single member of you know the the workshop that we're doing in july you know i really want the whole community to see this so that that we have in our minds a process um for how we are going to grow lf energy and so i i feel just enormous gratitude um for what you've offered because what you've done is kind of set us on a path that i think is really achievable so thank you very very much and the TAC, too. want everybody in the TAC to see it. Yep. So. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, if I think from a ne next step perspective, um, I, I would like uh, to make sure that really all the members see this, uh, the TAC sees this, the governing board sees this, the folks who are participating in the event in July see this. Um, so that, you know, we as a community really have our, our heads on. And, you know, I, I've been thinking about the tracks and the, the graphic that you were showing about, you know, looking at a six month planning period and, you know, really looking at the cadence of what happens, you know, kind of week by week. I, I would love to see that for every single track that is presenting in July so that they have something that they can share back with people that will help them get engaged. I don't want to lose this opportunity and interest. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to help. I think what you're all doing is amazing. So I'm happy to help where I can. Uh, and sorry, I got to hop off to go to my next thing, but it was great connecting with everyone. Really appreciate it, Jono. Very much. All right. Thanks, Bob. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Thank you all for it. Thanks, attending. everyone. Bye-bye. Talk to everybody soon.